Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Brook Army Medical Center Sexual Assault Awareness and Prevention event. Thank you for coming this morning. At this time, please rise for the playing of the national anthem and remain standing for the invocation given by Chaplain Woodford. It is, please. Please join me in this invocation for this very important occasion. Father, we offer this prayer for the lives affected by sexual assault and harassment. Because we are all made in your image, we want to honor and protect the sanctity of all lives. Give us the courage to prevent and intervene for those who are affected. Give us some awareness of others that exhibit the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It is our desire not to just minimize these sinful actions, but to totally eliminate these behaviors. As King David proclaimed to you with a contrite heart, create in all of us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. You are our honored guests at this observance. Guide, rule, and protect us. Through your holy and divine name we pray, amen. Please be seated. General Murray, Command Sergeant Major Reynolds, other distinguished guests, all service members, welcome to the Brook Army Medical Center 2022 Sexual Assault Awareness and Prevention Event. First, I wanna thank each and every one of you for your support on this very important campaign. This year's Department of Defense theme is prevention starts with you. At this time, please welcome General Murray for his opening remarks. Well, I'm gonna start off by thanking uh, Ms. Leonard for putting this together. He did a great job as always. And uh, sorry to appreciate uh, all the hard work and especially uh, retired Chief Wilson for coming. If you haven't heard him speak or do this before, it really is a, a special event and really does make you think about things in a, in a slightly different lens. Uh, it, it really is uh, impressive and important that we're here. Uh, you know, every April we sort of take a pause and increase our focus on sexual assault awareness and prevention. And, and it really is important. Uh, someone is sexually assaulted every 73 seconds. Let that sink in, right? A child is sexually assaulted every nine minutes. This is our responsibility. It's our responsibility to get this right. We have to take care of men, women, children. We, we can't mess up in this space. And we have to continue that focus because it's our responsibility to get this right. What is success? Arguably, it's prevention. Don't have a case? Moving in the right direction. If you can't do prevention, then it's making sure we support the right people, right? Victims and their families. And then, how do we hold those responsible for that assault for what they did? All of that is for us to be successful, requires a lot of effort on each of our part. And this requires leaders and followers. Right? We have to make sure we educate you. That's what we're doing today. We have to make sure we validate that education. Many of us have done this training numerous times, uh, and I hope it continues to seek in. And once you've actually done that, then you actually have to go out there and adhere to these standards. If, if we can't emphasize this enough and can't make this a priority enough, we, we will continue to struggle with this issue every 73 seconds, entirely too much. If we do this right, it actually impacts our readiness. It takes care of us, it takes care of each other. I'm not sure we always put that at the forefront when we have this conversation. How do we make sure that our core values are adhered to? And that's what this is all about. So please continue to focus in on these areas. There's three primary holistic approaches we're gonna focus on. One is all about prevention. Again, how do we make sure this doesn't happen? The next thing is make sure we prepare our leaders and followers. They actually know what they're supposed to do. And then finally, there's actually programs out there and there's requirements, new ones, which we're highlighting, and then things that have already been out there in policy and, and in law. We have to make sure we do this right. So we talk all the time about say, see something, say something. I think it's see something and hear something. Any, many times we hear things, we, we, we actually don't say anything. 
make sure when you say something, you're actually doing something, right? So move into that prevention space, move into that support space, make sure you're taking care of everyone because it's really important. For us to be successful, this has to be a priority because to protect our force is how we protect our mission. And if we're having an assault every 73 seconds in the US, we're not doing this well enough. So again, thank you for putting this on. I look forward to, uh, to a, a great discussion and, and a really eye-opening experience. Um, and back to you, sorry. General Murray, thank you for your kind words and your sage wisdom. Our guest speaker is Edward Wilson. Edward Wilson, stage name O.B. West, is a native of Los Angeles and a retired chief warrant officer of the United States Army. Aside from serving his country, he is an international spoken word artist, an advocate, and an author of a poetry book entitled Blossom. Obi's life with poetry began in 2011 in Colleen, Texas, under the tutoring of the Colleen Poetry Slam and has thrived ever since. He travels the world as a guest speaker presenting life-depicted poetry on a variety of topics. In 2016, he altered his concentration to sexual violence. His discussions, poetic delivery, and awareness focuses on prevention of disruptive behaviors. He is an avid sexual violence prevention advocate and is committed to promoting awareness through training and education. He is also a social activist who motivates individuals through poetry. Edward has invested a personal and sincere interest in bringing awareness to and changing the climate surrounding sexual assault and harassment throughout the U.S. military, universities, and communities at large. As a result of his dedicated and impactful approach to advocacy, he is selected by the National Organization of Victim Assistance, NOVA, as a 2020 honorary awardee for crime victims' rights. Edward Wilson is the owner of Worlds of West LLC and is known primarily by his stage name, OB West. He is also one of the founding collaborative partners of Difference Makers, 10 Strong, a violence prevention organization who aims to bring awareness to various forms of abuse in various communities throughout the globe. At this time, please help me welcome OB West. I am a leader, a strategic leader. I am the pinnacle of my position. Every day I walk with the weight of this nation on my shoulders. I will not forfeit nor fold over. I develop standard. My vision becomes the prescription for subordinate lenses. Where I place emphasis becomes their mission. So if I don't make it important, it's never imported into their regimen. So I vow to apply a forceful tone to initiatives that are integral to a growing force. I also understand in order for us to fight effectively, camaraderie must be the cornerstone to a rock steady army. But sexual attacks will cause camaraderie to explode like kamikaze and brothers and sisters in arms don't act like brothers and sisters after being disarmed by abuse. Internal feuds are of no use to us and it's a dishonor for self-inflicted damage to sow discord within our core. We will not be crumbled by internal war and I have been eradicated and I have been entrusted to eradicate such cases. I am a strategic leader, held at high regard but still grounded enough to connect with the root of the issue. Pain inflicted on the most junior enlisted will still sit high on my priority list. And sexual misconduct will procreate hate, creating enemies within our ranks. And when attacked, a survivor's visceral reaction is to extract, detach from the mission, creating a missing link within our chain. And then a chain reaction is a rash of bad action. So a strategic leader, I vow to be proactive in attacking this ep epidemic. The goal is to get in front of it before it pushes us backwards, combat the predator tactics with modern day warfare, proofed and useful to the modern day warfighter. And our conductors would be empowered to train with the impact of a locomotive. And I would be fearless and never afraid to address an issue with the same tenacity as a ticked off howitzer. I am a strategic leader. Rape culture within our columns and roles will be canceled based on the doctrine that I endure. 
I will open up my doors to feedback from the force and best practices we use to improve our tactics. I am the spearhead responsible for putting a spear in this wicked animal. And I will see to it that policies and procedures are airtight and that implementers are impartial when prosecuting. This disease will not beat us. Leaders, hear my guidance. I am a strategically. And my mouth and tongue are just tools that I use to talk, but I will communicate through my actions. So much so that I am convinced that if every soldier looked like me, this problem will be defeated. I am a strategic leader, leader at the core. And I have been called to police my peers if they appear to be wavering. Support my subordinates with the same intense consistency that I expect to be supported and never abort the mission until the opposition is obliterated. I am a strategic leader. And I understand that greatness, it starts with clear guidance. I possess and will provide that guidance. I understand that executable instruction is the instrument needed to produce a soundtrack for victory. I possess and will provide that instrument. With the power bestowed in me, I will see to it that our executors are armed with the weapons needed to execute this target. I am an auxiliary. Subordinate leaders will plug into me for power. My priority is the men and women who have volunteered to carry out this mission. I am a leader. So my name is Edward Wilson. I was born in, <clears throat> today I'm going to talk to you about uh, leadership influence. I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about myself. I was born in Los Angeles, California, right? A very influential to say the least, very influential neighborhood, right? I was raised a way. I was, I was raised to believe that there's a certain way that you had to carry yourself in order for you to survive. And there were some things that I did when I grew up in Los Angeles that was, that was extreme, and it was necessary for my survival, and I didn't realize how unorthodox or how off the wall those things were until I left. Um, my mother, I watched my mother with two jobs, right? She had two jobs and was always broke. The people who had money in the neighborhood, they didn't have a job. What they did probably wasn't legal. It didn't require a W-2. If they did have a job, that job was an alibi for having money. Just in case someone said, where did you get this money from? They can accredit to some small job. But the primary source of their income was something else. So I have a mother who has two jobs and no money. And I have people around me who have stacks of money with no job. Who do you think I'm following? My mother wasn't my role model she didn't have financial freedom, she didn't have quality of life, she didn't have peace of mind, it looked like they did, right? I can recall the decision I made when I decided I was gonna go to the military. I don't have a, a family history of military. I was walking down the street one day after I graduated and there was a car, it was a brown Mercedes Benz and it was old, it was tore up, and it was probably where this, this gentleman is sitting from me. And Mercedes Benz was driving this way and I was walking this way and I never remember, never forget the guy had his left hand on a stern wheel and he had an automatic weapon in his right hand and he fired three bursts. It was brr, 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 and I ducked and I went this way. The friend of mine who I was walking with, he ducked, he went another way and the car pulled off at the same slow pace that it pulled up with no urgency. So I checked on him, he checked on me. We was okay, we just kept walking down the street and that was it. We come back from where we was going and some people in the neighborhood pointed us out to law enforcement and said, those are the guys who had just got shot at. So law enforcement, they said, hey, the fat rewind, there were some shots on the other street that I heard prior to them coming over to my street. Some people over there got hit. So there's other cars on this other street and there's questioning going on. So they tell us, let me take you around the corner for questioning. So we put our hands behind our back. They said, you're not under arrest, so we can't handcuff you. Where I, was, where I grew up, you don't get inside of a police car unless you have handcuffs on. If you're in there without handcuffs on, then you're talking to the police. That's an absolute violation. So we got on that police car and laid on the floor on top of each other. Back then, they had a big hump in the car. And we laid on top of that hump so that people couldn't see us in that car. We got to the next block. They let us out the car. They asked us questions. And we hit it all to protect the person who just tried to kill us because the code in my street is you, don't, you handle court in the street. You don't handle it with the law. So I don't know what color the car was. I don't know what the guy looks like. They said, okay, you all are no help. We'll take you back. No, we'll walk back. We went back. Two weeks later, I'm in my house and I'm playing Genesis. John Matt. My mother said, hey, why you didn't tell me you got shot at? I said, I completely forgot about it. So I was pretty much desensitized to that type of thing and taught to protect the person who perpetrated against me. Later on, a guy was in my house. He had an Hispanic accent. And I'm in my room playing Sega Genesis again, and I walk out, and it's a recruiter talking to my mother. He's telling my mother, I can take your son to a place where he doesn't have to pay for food, he doesn't have to pay for housing. He's pretty much selling the DFAC in the barracks, right? <laughs> and, and, 
but it, it worked because my mother's most taxing expense is rent. I got to pay rent. I got to pay rent. So you're telling me I can go somewhere that I don't have rent and I don't have to pay for food and it's not the county jail. You're like, yes, it's not. I'm like, prove it. And I get on the bus and I leave, right? So you have this kid who has all this toxic behavior embedded in him. He thinks that this is necessary to live, and I'm on the bus, and I'm next to somebody probably like from Idaho, who's from the same country, but a whole different mentality, and we're on our way to the military. So you just pulled me out of LA, but you didn't pull any of that behavior out of me. So when I went to basic training, it was like a joke to me. I didn't believe in the authority. I get off the bus, and they're like, get on the ground. And it's funny, you're asking me to get on the ground. Where I came from, they put you in the ground. So you're asking me to get on the ground? No problem. So it was, it, was, it was a joke to me, so I didn't take it seriously. Then I got to my first duty station, and everybody and everything looked like an opportunity to me. I remember the first time I saw an alpha roster, I tried to sell it. There's 300 names and socials on this piece of paper. You know how much money I can get per sheet? If I go back to Los Angeles, this was my mentality, that that job was an alibi. But I needed to try to figure out a way to get money outside of that. So then I start realizing, you get in trouble here, they take your money. I can't get my money took. I can't go back home without anything because that's embarrassing. So I need to figure out a way to fix that. I got arrested. I was in a PX. I'm switching tags. I take a sock tag and put it on a pea coat. So I paid like $3 for a full length pea coat because it was priced like a sock. As soon as I walk out, they arrest me. This is in Fort Lewis. So this is the path that I was on because you uprooted me from my neighborhood, but you didn't pull the behavior out. So now I'm trying to figure out how to change this. And I don't like authority, so I'm figuring, okay, the quickest way for me to get away from being told what to do is to get promoted. The quickest I get promoted, the, less, the least amount of people I have to, that can tell me what to do. That was my mentality. So now I'm looking at people who have obtained the rank that I want, and I'm looking at them as a roadmap. Because I'm looking for guidance, and you are an example. I want to be the rank that you have, so how are you showing up? And however you're showing up, it gives me permission to be that way in the event that I want to get, because I want to be promoted. So these people started to become my guidance. Direct guidance wasn't as effective would be. Direct guidance as, hey, listen, go do this and I'll do it, that's one thing. But as far as advice, my mother would always tell me, save money, save money. But she never had the money to demonstrate what she was telling me, so I never saw the benefits of the advice she was trying to give me. My first duty station, I walked into a guy's office and part of him processing was the financial advisor. This was some dude who was on his way out, he was getting ready to retire, didn't have anything for him to do, they made him a financial advisor. He was probably dead broke, but I had to go in there and talk to this financial advisor and he told me what to do. Hey, listen, you're new in the army, save this much a month. I ain't saving nothing. I ain't never had nothing, spent everything I got. So I got paid on the first and I was broke on the second. Get paid on the 14th and I was broke on the 15th. This was my pattern. But then I would see people who were the same rank that I was, who had money, they had financial freedom, they had all these things that I wanted, and I would go seek them out and say, how are you doing this? We're getting paid the exact amount of money. How are you keeping money? So we have direct guidance that came from my mother, but I didn't see her demonstrate it. So it went in one ear out the another. And then you have a person who's not offering me any advice, but the way that they're showing up is serving as an example for me. And now I go to them to seek out who they are. So we have direct guidance. And then we have this thing called indirect guidance that we don't even know we're giving. It's subconscious just by the way we show up. Just by the way we show up every day, we're becoming someone else's permission to be, someone else's roadmap, and depending on your level of status, you're absolutely, you can become someone's direct order just by how you show up. So I wanna talk about guidance right quick and the difference between direct guidance and this subconscious indirect guidance. I remember being in Korea, I'm standing in a formation, change of responsibility ceremony, and I'm standing there, and I'm in parade rush, and we're waiting for the brigade commander to show up, and they tell us, hey, Take off your, your PCs, put them in your cargo pocket, put on your beret, the headgear for the ceremony. So we're standing there in our beret, and then a brigade commander shows up, and he gets out of the car, and he has on a PC. Instantly, the people who were in charge of those formations turned around, told us, take off the beret, put it in your cargo pocket, and put your PC on, right? So the, the, the brigade commander, he probably just forgot. He probably didn't even know where he had to be that day. He was sitting in his office. His assistant said, sir, let's go. He said, go where? He said, it's a change of responsibility. He said, oh, man, great day in the field artillery. Let's go. And he jumped up and he left and left his beret sitting. He's busy, right? And left his beret sitting inside of his desk. His slight oversight became a whole brigade's direct order. No one turned around and said, sir, it's beret. No, they turned around to us and told a whole brigade full of people. So because of the status that he's obtained, 
His oversight became a whole brigade's direct order. My first duty station, my battalion commander name was Colonel Bartrand. And I admire this guy to this day. I can say his name now because he's probably 90. This was 20 years ago or 21 years or 25 years ago when I was at my first duty station. And um, he was about this tall. But when he spoke, it was, he had no crutch words. Everything about him just seemed top of the line except for his BDUs. This man would not iron his BDUs. His BDUs were always balled up. And I remember a Monday morning, I'm standing in the motor pool, we're getting ready to do uh, PMCSs, and they have an open ranks formation. This is standard. We do this every Monday morning. The platoon sergeant and squad leader's coming down the line and checking a guy next to me, and this guy's uniform is balled up. And the platoon sergeant says to him something about his uniform. And this guy responds and says, how can you talk to me about my uniform and a battalion commander's uniform is balled up? And I never forget the confusion in that platoon sergeant's face where he didn't know what to say. So now that battalion commander, the way he looked every day became that kid's permission to look a certain way and it created a hindrance for this platoon sergeant to lead because of the way he showed up. So our self-representation can absolutely become someone's permission to be. How many people we have in here that are PETA people? Peter, the protection of animal, nobody cares? Peter? No Peter people. All right, no Peter people. All right, scenario, Peter's hiring, right? You ever see them people that stand on the corner with that big arrow, and they flip in the arrow, and they pop lock, and there's a tax center over here. They stand on the corner. Peter's hiring for that. They need you to flip the sign to point to their Peter office, right? And they're paying stupid amounts of money. They're paying like $500 an hour for five hour work days. This is $2,500 a day to flip their little sign. Who's taking the job? One, two, three. Sean Major's taking the job. Okay, I'm taking the job. I'm gonna be the best sign flipper that there is. I'm definitely taking the job. So who's somebody who said they were taking the job? Who hand went up? Your hand went up, you taking the job, right? You take the job. So you out there, you flipping your sign at the end of the day, doing all those things. At the end of the day, you take your animal suit off, you give it back, they hand you $2,500, and you walk off. What's the chances after you leave that day you're going to go talk to somebody about the importance of animal rights? You, you, you will? After you leave, you're going to go talk to somebody? She, she is the first person that has ever said, who else in here going to talk to somebody about animal rights? After one. So we had about 10 hands go up in two people. She's the first person that said that she would go talk to somebody about animal rights after she give the suit back. Most people like, once they get my $2,500, I'll talk about it the next day once I get back in uniform. And that's the difference between having a moral obligation to something and a professional obligation to something. Whenever you only have a professional obligation to something, you're gonna do that thing during the time that you are on duty, but once you're off duty, you're not going to enforce the same thing that you were standing for a few hours ago. Whenever your obligation is only a professional obligation and it's not a moral obligation, it's noticeable. It's, it's extremely noticeable, especially when we're talking about something as serious as sexual assault and harassment, suicide prevention, domestic violence, those social issues. And I've heard a lot of leaders say, listen, that's not important to the boss. We can't focus on that. It's not important to the boss. We have to do what's important to the boss because my rating is dependent on that. So pretty much your moral posture as the leader becomes inherent on the people who are under you because they're not emphasizing on anything that's not important to the boss. So even those things that we have a moral obligation to versus a professional obligation to serves as somebody's guidance on what they should be focused on. When my daughter was about seven years old, she uh, made the worst mistake of her life. She said, Daddy, listen, she was watching this stupid little YouTube channel where some little kid made a video describing the different types of parents. This is the fun-loving parent, the killjoy parent, the sleepy parent, the cheap parent, the spoiling parent. And she was like, Daddy, that's the one that you and Mama are. And it was the parent who always barks these things but never enforces it who always gives idle threats but never really does anything. Her life has been in shambles since that day. She's, <laughs> she's, she's 19 now, but she was seven when she did this. But what she let me know is even at seven years old, she could recognize whenever a standard wasn't being enforced on a consistent basis. And our inaction became her, her permission to behave 
in a certain way because she knew it wasn't go anywhere, it wasn't gonna go further than the yelling. We were gonna yell for a minute, we were gonna say that we were gonna do a certain thing, but we never carried out that thing. So as long as she was willing to take the yelling, she would do whatever it is that she wanted to do because she knew the only thing that was gonna happen was the yelling. The consistency in which we enforce a standard becomes permission to be for the people who are in our organizations. So all these things are forms of indirect guidance that subconsciously we may not even know that we're giving. Next thing I want to talk about is something that I call the basic component, right? You can go to any organization and you can pull a number of people out of the organization and ask them what's some of the priorities of your organization and they're going to be able to tell you because it's, it's, it's always emphasized. When they're in formations, they're going to hear about it. The mission statement talks about it. So you get 10 people, eight of them are probably going to have close to the same answer, right? So there's some things that we have to make sure that we make important. One is this thing I call the basic component. If you are everything, everything in life that's functioning has a basic component. If you're a race car connoisseur and you have a race car, you have all this expensive stuff. You have a high-end transmission, a high-end engine, the best rear end, all this stuff, but you show up to the line and you have no fuel, great chance you're not going to win the race because you don't have that basic component. You have all this expensive stuff and don't have a basic component. When I was in basic, we did this drill. Um, buddy set, buddy go. I'm sure you all remember. I don't know what they do now in basic. It's probably like buddy text, buddy. I don't know what it is. But it was buddy set, buddy go. And it was a drill showing us how to move through a combat area with two people. I say I'm set. I move forward. This person covers me. And then I tell them to go. I forgot exactly how it goes. And we move through this combat zone. Very easy. When you have BFAs on the tip of your weapon and there's no incoming fire, very, very easy. But you put us in a combat zone, I'm not sure we still fight like that, but you put us in a combat zone and there's actually rounds coming in. I don't care how set this buddy is. If I don't trust this buddy, this buddy ain't going nowhere. Not going. And if this person right here doesn't have a level of respect or regard for me, it's a great chance they're not going to lift their heads and take themselves out of their cover in order to protect me. So now, without that basic component of trust and respect, that combat drill doesn't work at all. Basic, the basic component of trust and respect is way more important than advanced training. I've seen situations where advanced training was absolutely snuffed out by fear. My first deployment, I'm in Iraq, and I'm sitting 1114, and I hear ting, 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 and his machine gun rounds hitting this seven-inch window by my face. The gunner, his name is Leonard, he's part of the PSD team. I was part of Fort Irwin. When I went to Fort Irwin, they told us Fort Irwin would never deploy. If the Fort Irwin ever deploys, the world is over. And they deployed as soon as I got there, right? So the PSD team, we didn't envy those guys. They stayed in the field. When we had our three and four day weekends, those guys were in the field rehearsing, 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 rehearsing. Day one, those rounds start hitting that vehicle. Leonard fell inside the vehicle. He wasn't hit. He was scared. So the 50 cal gunner is in the vehicle next to me. Nobody is returning fire from my particular vehicle. Leonard looks over to the left at his battle buddy, and his battle buddy said, bro, you got to get back up there. They exchanged eyes for a few seconds, and Leonard got back up there. He turned towards the threat, and he returned fire. Do you think that was advanced training, or do you think that was his absolute regard for that person who he had to look in the eyes? That was his absolute regard for that person. All heroism downrange is based on our regard for the other person. The advanced training didn't kick in until after that regard forced him to get back up there. You can take it out of a combat situation, just look at us as parents. If you have a kid who's in the middle of the street and a car's coming, I guarantee you, you've never been trained to withstand the instant impact of a vehicle, but you're gonna jump in the street without even thinking about it. Is that advanced training or is that regard for whoever that person is? So the basic component of trust and respect needs to be emphasized just as much, if not even more, than advanced training. The people in our formation should know that that's one of the most important things in our formations. This whole problem that we're talking about is based on a lack of those things. So just as much as we emphasize advanced training, we have to talk about those basic components of trust and respect. Now, when we talk about respect, we have to address the ambiguity of respect. Um, oh, I know I'm just rattling, but at any point, if anybody have any questions or anything, it's an open discussion. Feel free to raise your hands. This isn't a one-way conversation. But whenever we're talking about respect, we have to be able to address the ambiguity of respect. It seems cut and dry, it's not. My father's from Jackson, Mississippi. This has got to be the countryest man that I know. No offense to anybody from Mississippi. I'm from Los Angeles. 
My father, when he addresses women, they cupcake, pop tart, gummy bear, anything with sugar in it is the term that he uses. It's terms of endearment. We're here from in Mississippi. It's not disrespectful. It's absolutely, uh, it's, 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 it's allowed. It's considered as a term of endearment. So he carries that with him. So no matter where he goes, I don't care what the environment is, this is the way that he addresses women. I'm from Los Angeles, where you only address someone like that if you share that type of space with them. But if we don't share that space and you call me Pop-Tart, we probably gonna have a problem. So now you take these two people who are from the same country, different cultures, and you embed them in one organization like the United States Army, now you have, or the Coast Guard, now you have ambiguity as to what respect is. There was a guy sitting in the audience one day, he told me in Africa, him and his male friend, he's a male, he said him and his male friend, when they walk, they interlock their fingers. They hold hands. It's not an indication of their sexuality, it's an indication of their friendship. I guarantee you, anybody who I was raised with, if I just take it upon myself to interlock my fingers in theirs, first of all, that's the first, that's the last day of the friendship, and I'm probably gonna be assaulted because the culture is different. So when you have someone who brings what they consider respect from their culture and they impose their addition of respect on you, it can be very problematic. Everybody with an accusation against them is not a predator. There's a lot of cases where we have people who are demonstrating what they normalized in their culture here, not realizing that it's something that's wrong, and now there's an accusation against them. So if we educate, if we talk about respect, we talk about the ambiguity of respect, we emphasize that I don't just treat people the way I want to be treated, right? Because I might be into some crazy stuff. And if I treat you the way I want to be treated, you may be subject to some crazy stuff. But if I take the time to learn who you are and learn what your definition of respect is and then treat you based on your definition of respect, then I have less of a chance of offending you. So if we do that education and we can get rid of those cases of sexual assault and harassment that aren't intentional, they aren't predators, then now all we have to deal with is the blatant predators and those numbers will probably go down. Now we have less people to focus on. So it's very important that when we talk about respect, we address the ambiguity of it. And then there's the respect of authority versus the respective person. When I was in, the, I'm sure y'all get it all the time. I would be walking and a person coming towards me, if they didn't know who I was, they would be staring at my chest to figure out how they're gonna greet me. How they're gonna speak, if they have to salute, just if they're even gonna speak at all. So I'm gonna look at your chest to determine what level of respect that I need to give you. If it was somebody subordinate to me, they would speak with a lot of enthusiasm. If it was someone senior to me, they might not say anything at all. If it was someone who I had to salute, they would probably be looking for their salute, but that's the extent of it. That's the respect of authority versus the respect of person. There's numerous times that I've stood at parade rest or the position of attention for somebody, and the only reason I did it was self-preservation, because if I didn't do it, my check can be taken. But if I could slap the, I would have, right? And if I saw that same person on the, on the side of the road, they would still be on the side of the road after I saw them. There's no chance I was going to stop for them because I have respect for their authority, but not their person. So you can ask yourself right now, the person next to you, do I respect their authority or their person? And your answer is going to tell you whether or not you'll take care of that person in the event that they need you, which now influences bystanders. If I have respect for a person's authority, but not their person, and I see you in a crunch, we've looked at the statistics, and it says, based on all the cases we've had in this unit, these are all the components that we're in, we had alcohol, we had this, we had this. So whenever you see a situation and all these components are married in one situation, it's, prob it, it, it's, it's a probability that that might turn out bad. And I can see you in that situation, but if all I expect is your authority, that's on you. So how we respect people is very important. If you have to demand respect, it's probably just the respect of authority. In the military, we have this thing to where we have permission to treat people based off of their rank. It's just an unwritten permission. And some people utilize that to their detriment. And when you are subordinate to people, but you notice they're still treating you as if you're human, inherently, you're going to respect them. You don't even, they don't even have to demand it. You're going to respect them. So when you find yourself having to demand respect, it's, it's probably at that point it's time to do a self-assessment and see whether or not you're carrying yourself in a way that people naturally feel isn't respectful. Now, how do we train this topic? How do we train this topic? Um, it, was, it was three, I feel like the old dude in the PX with the pins in his hat talking about, it was 350-1. Is it still 350-1? Talked about training? Okay. So 350-1 talked about training. It talked about what the training standard was. And everything was measurable 
by score, um, by score, right? If you go to the, the range and you hit a certain amount of targets, it's going to equate to this score. If you're taking a PT test, it was PT test when I was in. Now y'all scaling walls and flipping. I don't know what y'all are doing now. But if you're taking a PT test and you run this fast, it equates to this score. You do this many reps, it equates to this score. So if I run this fast and you only run this fast, I'm more efficient than you in that event, bottom line, right? But when you talk about things like sexual assault and harassment, these type of programs, now it's measurable by the amount of time that you talk about it. So how do you gauge efficiency? If I talked about this for an hour, but they talked about it for an hour and a half, is it guaranteed that their conversation was more efficient than mine? And whenever you're, you're talking about enhancing a, a, a PT test, um, BRM, or things of that nature, you can identify your shortcomings. This is the area where I'm weak. So I'm going to go work, and I'm going to get better in this area, so when it's time for the real thing, I'm ready. The only time you can identify your shortcomings when it comes to sexual assault and harassment is right before, during, or after someone has been assaulted. So those things can't be trained the same. Whenever you're doing technical training or tactical training, you're training to enhance a skill. When you're talking about this, you are training to change a person. So those processes can't look the same. So how do we train when it comes to sexual assault and harassment? It can't just be limited to training. It absolutely has to be a lifestyle. So two ways that we can make this thing a lifestyle is one, we have to be conscious about reapplying lost definitions. Whenever something goes unaddressed for so long, it loses its identity as being wrong, right? Like jaywalking. Some places, some people don't even know what that term is. It's when you cross the street illegally, right? But if that's a term, and I always cross the street, and no one ever does anything to stop me, now it's just called crossing the street. It's not jaywalking anymore, right? Like, well, grass. That's probably everybody's first cuss out in the military is standing on somebody's grass, especially in the Army, right? So we're going to name that grass harassment. We're going to call it grass harassment. So say there's a patch of grass, and there's my destination is over there, and I'm walking here, and I don't want to walk around. So I cut across this grass, and no one says anything. What am I going to do the next day? I'm going to cut across the grass. No one says anything. That now has become my way to get to my destination. At some point, that area that I'm crossing is going to start to show the damage of that infraction not being corrected. It's going to turn to a brown path, like an unimproved road, right? So now when we see brown trails, what does that mean to other people? That's a walkway now. So now my indiscretion that wasn't corrected has now became someone else's permission. That damage has become consent for the next person to do the exact same thing because it went unchecked. Now it's not, it's not grass harassment. Now it's an actual trail. It's a way to get there. So when something is unaddressed on a consistent basis, it loses its identity as being wrong. But what if I stepped on the grass and as soon as I did it, I heard the sergeant major out the window, hey, and I look around. And I just hear somebody say, get off my grass. I don't even know where it came from, but I'm off the grass. <laughs> now I'm not going to do it. So now that damage is never going to show up because he just reapplied a definition to whatever that infraction is. So I'll tell you how this looks when we're talking about sexual assault and harassment. I had a barber, and my barber's cutting my hair, and there was four other barbers, all males. And I'm feeling, okay, this is a perfect time for me to get a sample of society. So I asked my barber, I said, hey, what do you think would happen if you went inside of a social setting and you grabbed a woman's crotch area? Oh, man, it'd be chaos. I'm going to have to fight her. Security guard's going to grab me. They're going to put me out. I might get arrested. This is all the things he said. I said, what if it's the other way around? And she grabs yours. What would you do? He said, oh, it's on. He looked at that as it's a come on. It's a way of flirting. So he has a different standard of what assault is for a woman than what he has for a man. So when he's a man, even if he enjoys that, what he's doing, he's speaking on behalf of our entire gender. When he allows that to happen, he's sending a message that this is an okay way to approach a man. So if a million people from my gender says that's okay, and I'm the million and first person, and I don't think it's okay, when I'm grabbed, what gives me the right to report? My gender has already made this okay, right? Because they allowed it, it's lost its definition of being wrong. So let's talk about another story. Another friend of mine who's a poet, he was telling me about when he was in college. He met this girl. They, were in a, uh, they went to her hotel room, and when he walked in the room, there were two other girls in there. The other two girls said, hey, we're going to smoke. You want to go? He said, no, I don't smoke. They knew he didn't smoke. So they left out the room, and they left him in the room with the one girl. She goes to the bathroom. She comes out naked. She runs and jumps on him. He stops her. 
and said, hey, hey, wait, wait. You know that's sexual assault. And she said, I never looked at it like that. After conversation, she told him that every year she targets a rookie on the basketball team. And she does that exact same thing. And he's the first person out of all the rookies that has ever turned her down. So you got a woman who runs out of the bathroom completely naked and jumps on a man, and she has never thought about the fact that that's sexual assault until he said the word. And she froze and said, I never thought about that. And then embarrassingly went and got dressed. What's the chance that she's going to do that to the next rookie? Probably not because he's now reapplied a definition to her actions, and she realizes that this is probably an infraction. So we have to be able to do that on a consistent basis. There's things that we contribute to, and we don't realize how it's creating a culture in order to fight against this problem. Sir, if I can ask you a question. We talked about the grass. We know how important beautific area beautification is in the Army, right? So you're walking past some trash, big trash, a can, paper and you walk past and you don't pick it up. What's the chances a junior enlisted is gonna say, sir, you saw that on the ground, why didn't you pick it up? <laughs> he says zero, zero. What he's admitting is he can be as wrong as he wanna be as long as he's the highest ranking person in the area. When we look at our formations, our formations have way more junior enlisted than they do seniors, right? How empowered are those junior enlisted? The answer to that determines how many effective bystanders we have. What if he walked past it on purpose and then went back to him and said, hey, look, did y'all just not see me walk past that? Yes. Why didn't anyone say anything? They're going to start babbling. Blah, 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 blah. And then he says, look, I'm senior to you. I am absolutely senior to you. But when it comes to right or wrong, you and I are equal. I'm not, it's not OK for me to be wrong any more than it's OK for you to be wrong. Now, at this point, he's empowering these individuals to say something. Not only is he empowering them, but now they'll check somebody else because the highest ranking person in the area told me I can do this. So if you get mad and you don't like it when I check you, so what? Take it up with him. He said I can do it, right? So that backing, whenever we are, we're, we're in a position where we have to be a bystander, Chris Wilson is another advocate, a ton of stories. Chris Wilson is another advocate, and he was standing inside of a store, and there was a customer in front of him, and the customer was absolutely berating the cashier. The cashier in shambles when his customer leaves. Chris didn't do anything, wanted to, but didn't. So when he steps up to the register, now this person isn't in shape to help him because of what that person just dealt with with the previous customer. Chris just leaves, he sits in his car, and he's questioning why didn't he do anything. Self-preservation is natural within all of us. They say all the time, if you see something, say something. That's way more difficult than what it sounds. Self-preservation is natural. In order for us to be an effective bystander, we have to defy what's natural, step out of our safe place, and put ourselves in a line of fire for someone else. Chris was safe right here. That had nothing to do with him. He got to step out of that safety and put himself in a line of fire. That doesn't come natural. So self-preservation keeps us in our place. In order for us to be an effective bystander, we have to be able to defy that. In this type of dynamic, when you talk about the armed forces and things of that nature, the only way we're going to feel comfortable with defying that is if we have backing, is if the leadership has empowered us. What if the police was in the back by the freezer and they didn't hear it or he saw them outside? He might have felt a little bit more, he might have more comfortable to do something because if it got crazy, the police are right there. He has backing. So as leaders, we have to empower our subordinates to to want to stand up, to be able to stand up. We have to give them the courage to defy that natural tendency of self-preservation. And in doing that, we also have to make ourselves receptive to correction. If I'm going to correct somebody and I know they're going to chew my face off, it's a great chance I'm just going to let it happen. I remember when I was in Fort Irwin, we had a supply room that was very unorthodox. It was authorized at 30 level, a 20 level, and three tens. So I was the 20, and we had the three tens, and then we had the 30 level. Sar Madlock. All these people are 90, so I can say their name. Sar Madlock, she, she didn't act in a way that made these individuals want. It just wasn't a comfortable work environment. So the 310 levels came to me, and they talked to me, and I went to go talk to her. And before I can get a word out of my mouth, she said, you don't check up. You check down. That's what she said to me. So if that's the message, and I actually take that, and I imbibe by it, now, in another situation, if I see someone who's senior to me and they're potentially harassing someone or they're going to walk into a situation that I know is going to be dangerous for them, what's the chances I'm going to step up and say something? I'm probably not because what she taught me is I check down, not up. 
So we have to make sure that that's not the message that we're perpetuating throughout our formations, that we're ineligible to be corrected because we are senior to you. We are senior, and that senior does give us certain privileges. But when it comes to right or wrong, everybody absolutely has to be equal. And I don't know if every, I didn't, when I was in the military, I don't know if every subordinate feels that they're equal when it comes to being right or wrong. So empowering a bystander or empowering the people is how we create a culture of strong bystanders. That's another way that we train this. Emotion. I went to an Air Force base and I'm talking to 20 people who went to school to be professionals for Sapper. And I asked, it was 18 people, and I asked all 18, one by one, why are you here? Each person were a survivor of sexual assault or very close to someone who was, except for one. One guy said, I just wanted to do it because I think it's important. But the other 17, they did it because they were a survivor of something or attached to someone who was. So things that happened to them made it important. It just weren't there because it was something had to happen in order to make it important. They were triggered emotionally, like me. I'm a junk food fanatic, right? Junk food fanatic. I can eat a piece of candy and read the nutritional facts, and it will say this is going to demolish your teeth and kill you, and I'll keep eating the candy while I'm reading it. But if I go to the hospital and I'm diagnosed with diabetes, and they tell me my life is in danger, instantly I'm going to change my diet because I've been emotionally affected by that information. The data wasn't enough, right? So we can look at this 78 slide deck that DA Sharp puts out, and we can look at it and, and take that data all day. But until we figure out a way to connect emotion to that data, it's less likely to become a call for action. So when we're training in a training setting as trainers, we have to figure out a way to create that emotion whenever we're talking about this topic. And I think we're reluctant to do that oftentimes because we don't want to trigger. Triggering isn't bad. If I'm sitting in the audience and you say something, and I say, you know what? When I leave up out of here, I'm going to make sure that I create a space so that that never happens again. I was triggered. So we have to figure out how to trigger without re-victimizing. We tend to associate re-victimizing with triggering as if it's the same thing. It's not the same thing. So if we can figure out how to trigger without re-victimizing and attach emotion to the data, then I think we get a more effective outcome when it comes to training. Languaging. Languaging is also very important when it comes to... Leadership. We talked about the struggle in trying to gauge efficiency when it comes to these conversations versus how efficiency is inherent or is gauged by, measured by score and other types of events. So when I was a property book officer, I would go to staff call or command and staff, different name depending on the organization I was in, and I already knew what the person, my leader at the head of the table was going to ask me. So all week, I worked to create a product that was going to allow me to give a satisfactory answer to this person because I didn't want my slides up there for too long. I wanted you to ask me a couple questions and say, okay, on to the S3. At that point, I don't even need to listen no more. I ain't even part of the meeting. You know, got past my slides. I don't care about anything else that's going on. This is what we do. We work all week to create a product that we know is going to be satisfying to the person who's sitting at the head of the table. So if I'm a Sark and I walk in there and the person at the head of the table asks me, how are we doing with training? Say, oh, well, we did an hour this day, two hours this what day. We're scheduled to do two hours on this day. We're going to be good. And I say, okay, next slide. Am I really checking on the efficiency of the training? Or am I only checking to make sure we met that standard that's in 350-1? But if I ask the person, did we have anybody who came forward either after the training or a couple days after the training? Normally, that's a gauge of a successful training when someone feels empowered enough to now talk about something they didn't want to talk about before. Did we have people who, who were engaged, voluntarily engaged? Not, hey, listen, three questions before we go to lunch and nobody's going to lunch. Not that kind of engaged, but voluntarily engaged. Did we have any? So when you start asking those type of questions, now you're actually checking on the efficiency versus just checking to make sure we made the standard. And now it gives that person something else to work towards. I just can't meet the hours no more because that's not going to satisfy the questions when I go in there every Wednesday. So now it motivates that person or it incentivizes, it creates an incentive for this person to go above and beyond to make sure I'm meeting the standard for the person who asking the questions. So as a leader, the way we inquire about the programs that are within our command shows um, how we feel about it and it allows us to gauge the efficiency. Gender neutral is also very important. I've said in trainings 
where there was two law enforcement officers in Texas. And they came up with a training about domestic violence and sexual assault and harassment. They travel around the world with this training. They came in Las Vegas. I live in Las Vegas now. So I figured I'll go to this training for a week. They created these scenarios. They're created. So these are real scenarios. In order for them to teach their class, they're going to do it with these scenarios. Every scenario had the man as the victimizer and the woman as the victim. So I sat in that class and felt like the class was being taught to protect the world from me. At that point, it becomes very hard for me to pay attention. So after about the third day, um, we were on break. These two gentlemen were by themselves, and I asked them. I said, hey, I noticed this. And they looked at each other. They said, we never thought about that. How do you never thought about that? You're teaching this class, which means you're supposed to be an SME in this topic. And they said they never thought about it. And for the future classes, they'll change the slides. There was an organization who asked me to come to their organization. They created a flyer. The flyer said, this can happen to your mother. This can happen to your niece. This can happen to your sister. This can happen to your auntie. It had all the people that this could happen to, and every gender was a woman. So if I'm a man in that organization and something happens to me, what's the chances I'm going to go forward? Probably not, because I don't believe that my organization thinks that this is my problem. And they might not even know how to care for me. So I'm probably not going to go forward because you've made it clear that you only think that this is a woman's problem. North Carolina, the definition of rape in North Carolina is forceful vaginal penetration. First and second degree um, rape is defined by forceful vaginal penetration. The term vaginal is embedded in the defini definition. So if I'm a man in that state, my state doesn't believe I can be raped based on the definition of rape. There's a lesser charge for sodomy, but based on the definition of rape, I can't be raped in this state. So whenever we're talking about this and we're not talking from a gender neutral perspective, we're sending a message to a certain gender that you're ineligible for this. So if it happens to you, don't even come this way. And as men, just by our chromosome configuration, we've already been convicted of consent, which is why it's very hard for men to report. So we can subconsciously contribute to that by how we address this topic. So we have to make sure that when we're addressing this topic, we're addressing it from a very, very gender neutral perspective. Um, another thing about languaging is zero tolerance. We've always all heard the term zero tolerance. I've seen this translated in two ways. I've heard a senior say, I have zero tolerance for this. And then I've heard a subordinate leader say, listen, the boss has zero tolerance for this. He or she don't want to hear it. If it happens, we need to figure out how to handle it so that we don't have to go talk and whenever that's your approach, I guarantee the way you're handling is probably going to be a detriment to that person who came forward with an accusation. So I assure you that when your boss says zero tolerance, what they're really saying is whenever it happens, we're going to address it to whatever extent it needs to be addressed to make sure we eradicate it and let people know that we don't have a tolerance for it. So if that means you have to come to me every day, come to me every day. We have zero tolerance for it happening. I'm not saying I have zero tolerance for hearing about it. So whenever we talk about zero tolerance, in order to alleviate that confusion, it's very important that we emphasize that hey, people are protecting their livelihoods in these organizations, right? When I was in the middle, my promotion was based on what my senior leader thought about me. Not what, I, what that person thought about me, my promotion is based on that. And that, that can create a conflict sometimes. So we have to make sure that we're telling people, hey, listen, this is not going to hurt you. I'm not saying I have zero tolerance for hearing it. So whenever we say zero tolerance, we just have to understand that that doesn't automatically translate the way we want it to. And that is very, very important that we put some explanation, attach some form of explanation to that so that people understand. The last thing that I, that I want to cover, and it's going to be real brief, there's a lot of leaders in here, and I gave the example about PETA recently. And the anomaly over here <laughs> said that she will go talk to somebody about it. Most people say that they won't. So if, if I'm doing a thing during the day and I'm being paid for that thing, and after I'm done doing that thing, I don't stand for that thing, that's also the difference between appointment orders and being an advocate. When you just have somebody who's on appointment orders and they're not an advocate, great chance they may turn into your problem as soon as they're off work. So whenever we're accepting people for these positions, to be advocates, we have to, to be um, sharp professionals, we have to first make sure that these people are indeed advocates, that they stand for this even if they weren't on appointment orders. And if we do that, 
will we'll make sure that these people are giving the proper care that they need to people who come forward with accusations, and they're really putting the emphasis into the program that needs to be there in order for us to affect some type of change. One last thing. Um, bystanders. We talked about bystanders. One of the best ways, especially in a, a dynamic to where there's a rank structure, and sometimes in order to, pr to protect the health of our office, we try to avoid certain types of conflict, right? The, the chaplain, chaplain, right? Okay. The chaplain is, is a prime example. The chaplain can walk in any room, and people go, don't say that, chaplain's here. <laughs> right? You automatically, even if you can walk in a chapel, and you'll still change your language because of the building you're in. When I was in Korea, they would put these red and blue lights on the rail. They would just tape these lights to the rail, and they would flash. So from a distance, all you saw was red and blue lights. So everybody would slow down slow down, shut their kids up, whatever it is that might get you a ticket, they would do it. They would automatically self-correct because they knew what those lights stand for. I talked to a law, enfor for law enforcement person who told me in the United States, sometimes they stage empty cars on the side of the road because that black and white car with nobody in it controls traffic. The chaplain has that, that, that thing to where people automatically self-correct in his presence. The chapel has that thing where people automatically self-correct when you walk into it. Black and white cars have this thing. You ever seen somebody who's driving a car that looks like an undercover car, but it's just a regular person, and you driving slow for like 10 minutes, and you just next to another pedestrian? You're like, this ain't, you know, you automatically self-correct because you know what these things stand for. So if people around me, right, if I'm in an organization, I hear something inappropriate, and I close my eyes, and I say, hey, listen, I don't know who said that, but please don't say that around me. I, I really don't like that or have a tolerance for that. I might inherit a name as a snitch or something of that nature, but I guarantee you now they feel like their, their well-being is threatened by my presence. So whenever they see me, shh, don't say that because such and such is here. So if you let people know what you stand for, who you are will automatically become, your presence will become a reason for people to self-correct whenever they are around you. And that's the easiest way to intervene. You don't have to say anything. All you have to do is be there. and People are going to automatically check themselves because they know what you stand for. So we have to not be afraid to let people know what we stand against, what our moral posture stands for, and what you'll notice that people will automatically fix themselves when they're around you. I promise that's the last thing. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Would you mind reciting the, the poem that you recited back in 2018 when you first came? Some people have not heard that poem. Okay. Um, in case you didn't hear, the request was for me to recite a poem. Has anybody seen this short video? Yes. Okay. Let's gauge the hands. If there's more hands, who's seen it? Okay, there's not a lot of hands, so I'll recite the poem. Um, there's, a, there's a malpractice active amongst the masses, and it's been causing massive chaos. It's normally masked behind friendships. It's masked behind smiles. It's manifested through margaritas and malt liquors, hard liquors, tequilas, tall boys. It takes place daily, but rarely talked about. I've been taboo for years. I violate through touch, text, and talk. Sometimes I even forcefully undress, yet you still have some who refuse to address me. Rain says, and for those who know who Rain is, Rain is a website that talks about national assault statistics, but don't waste your time. I'll tell you what they would say. Rain says in the United States, sexual assault occurs approximately every, every 68 seconds, which suggests since I've started this lecture, someone's self worth has been lessened due to unsolicited sexual aggression. Rain also says that every eight minutes, get this, every eight minutes, some menace has victimized a minor. What's even more gratifying is only 0.0006% of sex offenders will ever find themselves in prison. The startling statistic lends me the impression that I'm being protected. I would venture to say the biggest savior for a sexual assault assailant is your silence. And let me tell you what Sapro says. And again, you don't know who Sapro is. Sapro is a website that talks about armed forces assault statistics, but don't waste your time. I'll tell you what they say. Sapro says in the United States, armed forces, there was over 6,200 cases of sexual assault in FY19, right? This is 200 more than the FY prior to, and they try to accredit that increase to increased reporting BS. The truth is, I'm still occurring in outlandish proportions. 
Sapro also says that 98%, get this, 98% of harassment complaints come from the enlisted. 98%, what does that mean? Does that mean you officers are off limits to inappropriate talk or does your status just have you too afraid to report? Excuse me for being rude, but allow me to introduce myself. I'm the reason for all these briefings, the constant preaching and the redundant teaching. I guess your leadership figures that if you constantly train that eventually you'll be able to tame me. That's a large feat. I'm the SHA in your SHARP program. I'm the ulcer in the belly of your organization. I'm the degradation of your seven core values. I'm the bane of your SOC's existence. I'm the real deal. You all, you're just child's work. I am the strongest army on earth, and ironically, my recruits are forces from your armed forces. I force discord between brothers and sisters in arms, and forewarning, I've been swarming your ranks at alarming rates. All it takes is for us to be double distance away, double arms distance away, at close intervals, and for her to be dressed right, wearing something tight or something short, so it lets me know that she's open for my type of attention. See, she joined so she can be a part of something she can be proud of, and I'm sure her parents thought that she would be safe amongst your ranks, but I'm the paw print crawling up your daughter or your little sister's inner thighs while she's in her sleep. I enter her room so I can enter her wound. Alcohol, yes, alcohol normally increases my success rate. These two dudes saw me drag her. Oops, I, I, didn't, I didn't drag her. They saw me walk. They saw me walk her in, and neither of them said a word. Their nonchalantness is the reason I'm so accomplished. They may as well be my accomplice. The intervention is my kryptonite. I would be invincible if it wasn't for nosy battle buddies who's bold enough to butt their noses into my business. The only person with a chance of stopping me is a bystander who's willing to uphold the standard. But as long as you continue to stand down, then I'll continue to stand up and raise these stats up. By the way, let your EO rep know. I'm all for equal opportunity, right? I don't discriminate. I operate within seniors and subordinates alike. I was saw as a major issue once your sergeant major was issued walking papers for taking parts in the likes of me. That's, that's when I knew I had hit the big leagues. I love to ride the coattail of the higher ranking personnel, and I'm a pro at qui pro quo. In my simplest form, I come by way of a sly comment or maybe a compliment with just a drizzle of sexual content, and then I run rampant throughout your workplace, and I hide my face behind these jokes and jargon like, well, that's what she said. Hey, we need a larger screwdriver over here. That's what she said. And then the second I see you smile and you fail to correct me, I guarantee you I'll place the crosshairs across your head and cross you next time we cross paths. And contrary to popular belief, men, yes, men, all men, tall men, dark-haired men, gray-haired men, men are also a preference for me. I've been able to assault, oops, excuse me, talk. I've been able to talk at least one in six into unwanted sex. And most aren't man enough, excuse me, most are two man to admit it so I'm able to operate in iniquity without penalty. You see, an assaulted man's ego is badly bruised, but it's still too huge to seek assistance. So that heinous act, it just sits in his system and it eats away at him like cancer. See, there's no chance of assisting a man who insists on keeping me inside as his little secret. And most of you, you think that I'm nocturnal, right? You think that I occur at night. No, I'm not. I knock whenever the opportunity suits me, and I'm normally suited in a familiar face. And I've heard some say that about 8 and 10, 8 and 10, how many women do we have in this room? About 8 and 10 military women have met me. Only 3 and 10 will admit it. It's probably because they're afraid that you'll think they're the reason why the crime is committed. It's because you say stuff. You make comments like, well, that's what happens when you wear those rape clothes. Right When your walk says I'm willing to let you assault, harass me against my will. Everyone knows that permission and promiscuous are paternal twins. You can't blame him if she was out after 1 a.m. It's common knowledge that all your body parts are up for grabs after midnight. She met me because she kept a grown man parked in the friend zone for too long when she knew all along all he wanted to do was break his parking brake off in her. She should have known better than to trust someone who called themselves a friend. Let me give you a few other reasons why she didn't report it. She didn't report it because the last time she was the subject of something similar, she was subject to questioning like she was the prime suspect, right? She didn't know that assault was punishable by finger pointing. She said her command, yes, her command held enough fingers in her face to outfit a million hands. She didn't know that her cute little denim shorts would be called to the stand as a cotton material witness to testify against her that her legs were out after midnight. She didn't know in the land of the free harassment, that's punishment for having the nerve to choose your own wardrobe. She had no clue that she could be convicted of having an enticing figure. Now go figure. Assaulters, they're people just like we are, right? We don't deserve to be tempted. 
In case you hadn't sniffed it, I'm sexual assault and harassment. Until you learn to control me, I'll continue to be the oasis of hate surrounding your ranks. I'm the new age form of fratricide. I'm the sum of division. Until you figure out how to stick together, you'll never be able to solve me. I'm a combat minimizer. And until you learn to defeat me, you'll never be able to defeat your country's number one enemy. So I would like to thank each and every one of you for your ongoing support. So now that I've recited the poem, I have to address why that poem was written. A um, couple reasons. One reason is in any situation in life where there's two opposing forces, one force studies the other force to figure out how to be successful, right? Friendly sports, sporting teams study other sports to figure out how to be successful. Boxers study other boxers to figure out how to be successful. Even in architecture, they build buildings based on their potential threat. Right, if you change if that, that door right there, if I walk to that door and press it, convenience, I just walk out the door. But if you change the hinge mechanism on the door, now I have to grab the knob, take a half step back, and then leave. So there's instances where people have cracked the glass, took some stuff that didn't belong to them, in a panic, they run to the door, and they're trying to kick open an unlocked pool door when all they had to do was pull it and exit. And they were slowed down long enough to be caught. Jeffrey Dahmer, uh, not Jeff, Ted Bundy. If anybody knows Ted Bundy, law enforcement went and spoke and studied, spoke to and studied Ted Bundy to figure out how to catch other serial killers. So it's very important that we are aware of what the tactics of a perpetrator are, why they're successful. Are we doing anything to help them with their success? If you are a parent, how many parents we have in here? You're a parent. If you are a parent, you are a parent, you have a school-aged child, and your child is in the bathroom, and another kid says, I'm going to go in here and beat the crap out of this kid. Watch the door for me. And Sergeant Major watches the door. Kid Sergeant Major watches the door, right? Aren't you just as upset with the person who held the door as you are for the person who abused your child? We have to make sure we aren't the individuals who are holding the door, right? And if we know what the tendencies of a perpetrator is, we can figure that out. Predators have like a toolbox. And I believe that that toolbox is filled by society. So when they hear you say that, well, if she has on a certain thing, that implies she's promiscuous. She wanted it. When they hear you say you can't rape a man, right? I mean, you can't rape the willing. Man always wanted anyway. When you hear somebody say, my grandmother used to tell her nieces and her daughters that don't go anywhere after midnight. Only thing open after midnight is legs, is what she would tell them. Me as a young man, I would hear that. So now I feel like somebody coming to my house after that time frame, there must be come, they must be coming to open legs. If I'm a predator and I hear that, I put it in my toolbox. So now when I'm looking for someone to victimize, I'm building my alibi at the same time. The same concept of, of cleaning while you cook. You cook and you clean. So when I'm done cooking, I don't have a mess to deal with. So if I build my alibi, why I'm finding somebody to target, once I've struck, then I don't have a big mess I have to deal with because I've, I've pretty much found someone who failed up under this criteria. So now I'm standing in court. There's a jury box with 12 people who are microcosms of society. They were walking to work. Somebody picked them up by the head, dropped them in the courtroom, said, this is where you're going to spend your next six months. So they've been brainwashed and conditioned with those same stigmas that we perpetuate. It's a great chance that when I stand up there and I say, well, the person came over after this time and she was wearing this, so I was kind of confused as if somebody's going to side with me and I'm going to walk. We have to make sure as individuals, we're not filling a perpetrator's toolbox, right? Why, why are they so successful? Because they blend in. Um, we have drivers in here. If you're on a freeway and the speed limit is 65, but everybody's going 75, nobody gets pulled over. Everybody's going 75. But when somebody starts going 90 and they zipping in, that's what the police is going to get. So when wrong is widespread, it's hard to police. This, the, the amount of people who are policing wrong is normally smaller than the people who need to be policed. So when we're wrong across the board, it's very hard to police. So if you walked inside of a bank 10 years ago and you're in a bank and you're ready to go to the teller and then somebody walked in with a mask on around their face, what would you have done? How would you have responded to that? Trying to steal it. You're trying to steal something. What if you walk in a bank today, somebody walks in with a mask? <laughs> it, it, right. So now a person who has ill intent, they blend in because they look like, just the, re they look like the rest of us. So when your behavior, you're not a predator, but predators, they have this, this um, continuum of harm where I'm going to tell inappropriate jokes and I'm going to see who tolerates it. And then I'm going to become overly touchy and I'm going to see who tolerates it. And I'm going to continue to do these things until I strike. And then when I strike, I'm going to use your tolerance against you. I'm going to say, well, you was always okay with the jokes, so I didn't know there was a problem. I used to always massage this person, soldier, so I didn't know it was a problem. So I'm using the tolerance against the person. But now I'm a person who's not a perpetrator. 
but I tell inappropriate jokes because I just like the social currency. I like people to laugh at me. I'm overly touchy because I'm from Jackson, Mississippi, and I just think that it's Southern hospitality. So you have two people doing the same thing who has different intent. How do you tell one from the other? And the perpetrator is now able to blend in because this behavior is widespread. But if we know the tendencies of a perpetrator, we can delete that, they, we deplete that behavior from ourselves so now they stand out. When we see it, we know we have a problem. So that's why it's very important to know that perspective. Um, that poem wasn't written to antagonize. It was written to, to inform. If we had actual predators who say, yes, I was skewed at some point. I'm better now, so let me talk to you about why I did what I did and how I was successful. I think we would get a lot more, but they're not showing up that way. So I had to create something um, that I felt like would help in that area. So that's why that poem was created. For real, I'm done. That was awesome. Thank you, Opie West, for coming and, and doing that for us. I, I can speak for me, that was phenomenal. And thank you for your time, sir. At this time, General Murray and Command Sergeant Major Reynolds will present a token of appreciation to Opie West for sharing his presentation on how leadership influence affects human behavior. Ladies and gentlemen, Command Sergeant Major Thurman Reynolds, Brook Army Medical Center, Command Sergeant Major, for his closing remarks. Again, thank you for your, uh, your time uh, and your messaging. Uh, and uh, and I'm, on behalf of uh, Team Bamsey, uh, we thank you uh, for sharing your time and your messages with us. And hopefully, like I said, I hope it resonates with everybody in the room and those that are listening on, online. Uh, hopefully you feel empowered within our organization that if you see anything wrong, no matter what it is, if it doesn't fall within the Army values, uh, within you know, what is right and decent and treating others with dignity and respect, that you feel empowered to stand up and say something. Uh, I hope everyone on Team Bambi feels that way. If you're not, you are empowered. Uh, to correct something. Uh, like you mentioned earlier, if you walk by something that you know is wrong, you're setting a new standard that empowers others uh, to do that wrong. Uh, so no matter you know, what, what member you are or where you work within the organization, uh, you know, if you see something wrong, say something. Make a correction. On the spot corrections, everybody's empowered to do that. Um, thank you for joining us uh, today for this event. I uh, truly appreciate everyone that's on Team Bamsey. Uh, thank you very much. We are now going to have General Murray sign the proclamation in recognizing SAPM 2022.
And this concludes our presentation. Thank you so much, Mr. Wilson. Thank you so much, my command team, for coming and all our guests. Thank you.